Okay, so last uh, week, we left off, the last thing I covered was this grain boundary strain energy. And I noticed that there is a, some kind of typo, because I say here, I have a D in this equation, and then to divide through here by, multiply by one over D, and then somehow the D disappears, right? So I was very confused about this, and it took me a long time to track it down and where I got this. So the big grand sweep of this comes from the Reed Hill reading that I assigned, right? It's got, but they reference Hearth and Lotha. And so I was taking stuff out of there. And essentially I was using the, for the first part of the derivation, one source, and then the final result from another source, which were slightly inconsistent with each other. And that made me angry. Why are they inconsistent? So I went back to Cottrell, the original paper, and that's also inconsistent with the other two references. So I'm sorting, tracking that down, <laughs> figuring out what actually is um, it's supposed to look like. But for the purposes of the class, the actual steps of the derivation don't matter, right? What does matter is the result. Right, and that is essentially the read this end of the, what we call the Reed Shockley formula, and that low angle boundaries are going to be lower energy than high angle, and that uh, once you reach once you go past about 15, 20 degrees or so, depending on the system, they sort of plateau out. There were a couple quick questions at the end of class as to why. Uh, if this is obviously BCC, because I'm talking about a 210 twin, why it goes to 90 instead of following the McKenzie distribution and dropping off at 63, whatever, whatever that is. And that's actually because this is not misorientation. This is rotation about a specific plane. And it's rotation about the 210, this 210 plane. Right, so that doesn't have the same symmetry of the, as the overall crystal, right? So this is starting with if I have if I'm this is the energy of a twist boundary about the two one zero crystallographic direction, right? So that's why it goes back at ninety. So it's not symmetric because of the the interesting thing about two one zero. If this were say a cube face you would expect this to be symmetric left and right. You would have these, this little cusp here at this low angle, right? But because of the, the, the 210 is not as regular of a plane. Right? Uh, it looks like that, right? That was just the effect of core energy. Okay, and so where we left off was talking about surface tension. Right, so the surface tension of a grain boundary, you can think of this as uh, the grain boundary as being like the bubble, the, a soap bubble, right? So the, a soap bubble is an interface between two, two pieces of air, right? The air inside the bubble and the air outside. And it's a physical thing and it has, if they're spherical because there's a, a surface tension, right? And they're, Right? You never see a square bubble, right? And so this really is an important experiment for uh, grain coarsening. Has anyone ever seen the classic um, video uh, from uh, Bragg, you know, Bragg of Bragg's Law, Lawrence Bragg? It's called, um, it's on YouTube. It's the experimental uh model of an experimental model of a bubble raft for metal structure, right? And he's got a 2D thing of soap bubbles where they're actually atoms and he pushes them together and they make you can see dislocations and interfaces form and and all this. And it's also is really important for uh understanding the physics of grain growth and grain coarsening. What people did was take a soap solution and put it in a sealed tube, shook the heck out of it and then let it sit and watched as the 
eventually it co coalesced into a very small number of bubbles from a very dense, dense film, right? And that's how the physics of grain boundaries came about only from watching the interplay of the surface tension between all the, uh, all the bubbles, right? Remember there's an energy associated with all of that, right? So the system would ideally like to minimize the, uh, the overall energy. So the thing about grain boundaries is it's difficult to measure the, uh, the energy. How do you measure the surface tension of a grain boundary? Right? Experimentally, that's a very difficult thing to do. You can use ellipsometry. Ellipse, ellipse, how do you say that? Ellipsometry? Yeah, ellipsometry. Right, where you put a drop of water on the surf surface of a metal and watch the angles that it makes. And if you know the you know the surface energy of a water droplet, and you can look at the contact angles with the surface of the metal, you can use uh, equilibrium considerations to determine the energy of the of the free surface, right? So that it ends up to be about one and a half joules per meter, about 20 times that of water. Then you can then do experiments to observe grain, the surface tension of the grain boundaries relative to a free surface through grain boundary grooving experiments. And we'll talk about those um, in just a little bit. So it turns out that the surface tension of a grain boundary is roughly about that, one third of that of a, the, uh, that of a free metal surface. So we can, we can begin to get the energies of different grain boundaries relative to each other by considering uh, static equilibrium, right? Here we have a triple junction. You can just imagine that these are ropes tied at a center, right? If the forces on each of these are uh, equal, Right, then this is naturally going to form 120 degrees here by equilibrium physics 101, right? Right, you have a balance, balance of forces and a balance of moments. Right, so we can set up very simple relationships where we have the surface energy or the line tension of A, right, over the sign of this angle A. Okay, so that means that provided these are all high angle grain boundaries with equal, approximately equal energy and equal surface tension, triple junctions will generally always form 120 degrees, right? Which was something we observed from that, from our micrographs. But we have to remember that grain boundaries are not fixed in space, right? They move by short range diffusion, right? There's nothing stopping an atom from w moving from one side of the interface to the other, right? A lot of important transformation mechanisms happen that way. Massive transformation, for example, completely governed by short range uh, diffusion. So grain boundaries are always seeking to find uh, the lowest energy. Right? And so boundaries tend to straighten, grains tend to grow, all while maintaining an approximate static equilibrium at the, at the, triple, at the triple line. Right? So the key thing with anything else is we're trying to minimize our free energy. The right? system is always trying to minimize free energy. Right? The rate at which it happens is going to depend on temperature because that controls how often... Uh, how much thermal energy we have to bias the, the jump. Yeah. Can you read this again? Atomic jumps. Atomic jumps, right, which lower the free energy are favored to jumps that raise the free energy. Okay, so if this, imagine here you have a jump which is going to strengthen this interface, right, on a very small atomic level, right? That's more likely to happen 
than a jump going the other way, which will tend to, right, because you're raising the energy of the system, right? You have a fixed amount of thermal energy, right? It's like, if this is my initial state, this is my final state, right? I have a lower activation energy to overcome to go this way than to come, to come this way. Right, so there'll be a net. Right, jumps both ways happen, but the probability of a jump happening that lowers the energy is higher. All right. Yeah. Can you say that, uh, like the democratic brains with star jumps compared to EPS brains have like uh, greater circumstances? Okay, so that's solidification, right? So we're here. We're talking about. Um, A, I, I would say a final clean polycrystal structure, right? So the the um, when you're talking about dendritic growth, you're talking about the solid liquid interface, right? And instabilities that form in the growth, which is a different can of worms altogether than just here where we're talking about the pure solid. Pure solid state. We'll talk about that at uh, uh, a different time. Okay. So why do we always see triple lines? Right? Why is this configuration unstable? Right? After all, it's in equilibrium, isn't it? Right? The force is all balance. Our moment's all balance. Right? In fact, as long as we're right here and that moment's zero, right? so no, no problems there. Right? Why is this going to break up? Why do we see triple lines and not quadru quad quadru quadruple point lines? Right? We typically see a quadruple point, right, the grain corner where triple lines meet. But if you slice through an arbitrary microstructure, you never see them. Why not? Yeah. It's lower energy, right, definitely lower energy, but how do you see that it's lower energy? So if we limit ourselves by saying we need to have four crystals here, right? And if you look at the actual amount of grain boundary length in here versus the amount of grain boundary length here, here we have two lines across both diagonals, right? So that's two square root of two of length. Here, for a good chunk of it, we only have one line. So there's actually just, it really comes down to, for the same amount of partitioning, we can get, we can break our structure up with much less grain boundary surface area, right? So it's just an energy minimization, an energy minimization argument, right? Of course, this all assumes that these are all high angle grain boundaries, right? When we have, uneven grain boundary energies we have uneven grain we have uneven surface tensions right then what happens to these angles right if one if i'm pulling if we go back to three ropes if one person starts to pull more this angle here if if gamma c was higher then angle C would shrink, All right? So really low energy interfaces, say sigma three twins and kneeling twins in FCC, they don't follow the 120 degree rule, right? Whenever you have a twin, the energy penalty 
for keeping for deviating from a perfectly flat straight interface is much less than the energy cost of deviating 120 degrees for a triple line. Right? Okay. So I mentioned we measure the inner the interface the interfacial tension relative to the free surface. So if we have a polished surface here and we have a grain boundary that's approximately orthogonal to this surface, right? And we heat it, we get something that looks like this. All right? What's going on? All right? What's the mechanism for this? And how on earth does this tell us what the surface tension of the grain boundary relative to the surface is? Think about equilibrium again. Here you have a free surface, here you're pulling down, right? We thought of these as ropes, or imagine a trampoline with a tarp tied to the bottom and you're pulling down on that tarp, <coughs> right? The mechanism for it is surface diffusion, right? Your atoms will migrate up this way to maintain an angle well, what's the angle going to be if I said the tension of the grain boundary is roughly one third that of the surface? Is it right? You can plug it into your equilibrium calculations, but is it going to be more or less than 120 degrees? It's going to be bigger than 120 degrees, but you can measure that angle and Right, it becomes a lot tricky if this trickier if this isn't orthogonal to the surface, right? But essentially, that's experimentally how you can measure grain boundary energies in a metal. Right, it's a really indirect experiment. First, we have to measure the, the energy of the free surface by ellipsometry. Right, then do a series of experiments and try and get statistical information on this act on this provided that we've held it long enough for it to go to equilibrium in avoiding any surface corrosion or oxidation that's going to happen. So they have to do it in a really controlled atmosphere, right? Okay, not all interfaces are just simple grain boundaries. A lot of what we're gonna be talking about is precipitates, precipitation, precipitation strengthening all these different intermetallics and secondary phases that form, right? So we need to be able to look at the boundaries between phase one and phase two. Well, we still essentially do the same thing, right? So if this is a precipitate forming on a grain boundary, right? We assume that these two are going to be symmetric, and here, right, we can do our, our calculation, and you get a relationship between the angle, the dihedral angle, and the ratio of interface energies like this, right? What happens when this angle, when this ratio here, this energy of surface, right? falls uh, less than one half, right? Meaning that the energy of the precipitate um, grain, the precipitate metal uh, interface is significantly less than that of the grain boundary energy, right? What happens then? Well, if this interface tension is low, then we get a continuous film that forms. We wet the grain boundary rather than forming discrete particles. All right, really, really important uh, reaction. 
a huge an, a, a, an extreme example of that is bismuth and copper, right? 0.05 percent uh, bismuth and copper will completely wet all the grain boundaries and cause uh, embrittlement. Right? You can basically pick the copper grains apart. Right? This was a a classic experiment, right? Where people grew large grains in copper, copper bismuth alloy, and then basically plucked apart the grains with tweezers and did all the statistics to see how many faces a grain has, how many neighbors a grain has. Can you imagine pulling apart a metal sample with tweezers and counting the, the edges and facets? And, but really important work in the 40s and 50s, right? When the surface tension, the interface surface tension is higher and we have low concentrations, we tend to form discrete particles at the grain boundaries. Right. Why do we tend, why, why am I, all right, first off, not all particles are going to form at the grain boundaries. There are some ones that will form in interior to the grain. But in general, nucleation on a lot of systems tends to be much easier at the grain boundary. Right. You have more space, you have more nucleation sites. Right. Why don't these come together to form a larger particle? Why do they stay decorated on the drain boundaries? That's why I'm not letting you guys get away with it. Me giving the answer. Someone has to come up with this. Think about it both from a thermodynamics and a kinetics point of view. All right? If this interface energy is high, the system naturally wants to grow a big particle, big spherical particle, right? Because that's going to minimize our surface to volume ratio, the least amount of surface energy possible. Why doesn't it happen? Diffusion is slow. Right? Even grain boundary diffusion is slow. Right? You have to have long range diffusion to move all of this together, right? And if this is an intermetallic, it has to stay stoichiometric, right? So every time you diffuse one species away, right, you're creating vacancies and you're, you're creating electronic and structural defects in these precipitates, right? So yeah, given an infinite amount of time, it's going to reach a lower energy state. But we don't worry about that right? when we build things. Right? A lot of times, if you do the calculations, the, this whole metal sample, the whole bridge will turn to rust long before we worry about the diffusion happening and forming one big, one big thing. Diffusion is, is often really, really slow, right? Think about it. How long, anyone ever give, give you the calculation of if you drop a spoonful of sugar into a cup of boiling coffee, if you neglect convention, convection, how long it would take to, for the sugar to, equal, to have a, a uniform concentration of sugar in that cup of coffee? by strictly diffusion, it's like geological time, right? It's like the age of our universe kind of time, right? The cup of coffee would be long gone before that, before that happens, right? Diffusion is really, really slow. So wrapping this up, there's one more, one last topic I want to hit, and that's of uh, Coherency. Right? We have to describe how good of a match the interface between our metal and our secondary phase phases. Right? So if there's a nice one-to-one -one match. Wow, that is loud. What they're doing. 
if there's a nice one-to-one -one match, right, this is a coherent interface. There's always a, for each partner in the, each atom is nicely bonded, right? We don't interrupt our, our structure, there's a nice continuous, right? The opposite of that is a incoherent interface, which is where, where the atoms meet is more like a general high angle grain boundary than a nice, neat, ordered interface. And then somewhere in between, it's very rare to have perfectly coherent interfaces. Most of the time when things are perfectly coherent, there's either a large amount of strain due to the distortion of these stretching of these bonds, or they happen to have exactly the same or near the, nearly the same lattice parameter. Most of the time you get what we'll kind of colloquially call a semi-coherent interface, where you have a coherent interface dotted with dislocations, which reduce the strain energy, right? So it's just a, a terminology, um, terminology. So here's just an example of a semi-coherent interface between uh, two different phases. And here's the work I was referring to. So here, essentially, they there were a couple different experiments. I think one was uh, gold decorated with with mercury causes it to dissolve. There was copper bismuth. But there's a whole bunch of different systems where everything goes right to the grain boundaries and makes it all fall apart. Right. So you can grow grains and, and do it. Most people have not really ever seen grains in 3D. So here's a well-annealed sample. And what do you notice is that the grains themselves is only three bins, right? Sort of broke the grains up into different size bins for a histogram, right? And notice the disparity, right? Notice how, how much larger the, the biggest grains are than the smallest grains. And notice in 3D, in 2D, everything looks kind of like, eh, it has about a regular shape. They're roughly equiaxed. But when you look at the number of faces and facets and edges on these grains, the structure in 3D is actually quite a bit more complicated than it is in 2D, right? The fact that most of the time we're looking at 2D sections of micrographs really hides a lot of details, right? There's the, the famous example with martensite, where people talked about martensite needles for 50 years before someone realized, hey, if they always look like needles, no matter what direction I cut through them, they're actually plates, not needles, right? So um, the 3D grain structure is actually really kind of complicated. With serial sectioning, now we can uh, begin to collect orientation information in 3D, right? And this is a nickel super alloy. And here's annealing twins that run through it. So these are low energy sigma three boundaries, right? But look at the crazy shape of this thing, right? And this is just one grain. Right? All of these are these really complicated space filling things with different facets growing and shrinking at different uh, at different rates. All right. Okay, so that's it for uh, the first bit. All right. So that everything for that set is. Is posted.